So we'll continue talking about thermal energy. Um, we've talked about how when two objects at different temperatures are placed in contact with each other, heat will flow from the warmer object to the colder object. And the heat will flow until both the materials reach the same final temperature. So the amount of heat energy that's lost by the warmer object is equal to the heat gained by the cold object, assuming that nothing is lost to the surroundings. So we can define one of those substances as the system and the other as the surroundings, and then we can quantify the heat exchange like this. Let's see. I'm writing in the wrong box. The Q, Q for the system, the heat gained or lost for the system, is equal to the heat gained or lost by the surroundings, but opposite in sign. So this does not mean that Q surroundings is negative. It just means that we change the sign on one of them, and then they're equal. It's like the exchange of money, right? So this allows us to um, look at energy exchange in a, in a different way. So here we have a block of metal at 55 degrees. And um, you know, that block of metal could get to 55 degrees in a number of ways. One way is it might be sitting in an oven that's at 55 degrees. So we know it's 55 degrees. We put that block of metal into a beaker of water. And the water started out at 25 degrees. So this hot block of metal is going to transfer heat to the water. The metal's going to cool down. The water's going to heat up. This should all make sense. Exactly how much the temperature changes for the water depends on the mass of the water, the mass of the metal, and the specific heat capacities of the two substances. So the change in temperature for the metal and the water will not be the same. But the heat lost by the metal will be equal to the heat gained by the water, but opposite in sign. So we learned that Q equals MC delta T. So Q for the metal is equal to the mass of the metal times the specific heat capacity for the metal times the change in temperature for the metal. And that will be equal to um, negative Q water, which is mass of water, specific heat capacity of water, change in temperature of water. It's hard to measure the temperature of a block of metal just by itself, right? How do you measure it? Do you just stick the thermometer on the outside? You can't put it in. Like, you know, if you're measuring the temperature of a pot roast or something, you stick the thermometer on the inside, right? If you're taking the temperature of a beaker of water, you put it inside the water. You can't put the thermometer inside the metal. So it's kind of hard to measure what it's doing. But in this water, we know that the metal will cool down, the water will heat up, and at the end, there'll be the same temperature. We can put a thermometer in the water and measure the temperature of the water, and then we understand that the metal will be at the same temperature. <coughs> so we can use this equation to find missing pieces of information. So here's an example. Block of copper of unknown mass has an initial temperature of 65.4 degrees Celsius. The copper is immersed in a beaker containing 95.7 grams of water at 22.7 degrees Celsius. When the two substances reach thermal equilibrium, the final temperature is 24.2 degrees Celsius. What is the mass of the copper block? It can be helpful to draw pictures. So um, we've got a beaker of water. And water's blue, right? Um, what do we know about the water? We know it's mass, right? The mass of the water is 95.7 grams. What's the initial temperature of the water? 22.7. What's the final temperature of the water? 24.2. So 
So that's all of the information that the problem gives us. And then we've got a block of copper. So that's kind of copper colored, right? That's sitting in the beaker of water. What do we know about the copper? We know its initial temperature. It started at 65.4 degrees. Do we know its final temperature? Yeah, it's going to be the same as the water, right? Because the thermal energy will transfer as heat until they come to the same temperature. So the final temperature for the block of metal is the same as for the water. Those are all the numbers that were given in the problem. So we need um, to use that Q system equals negative Q surroundings. So Q for the copper is equal to negative Q for the water. Q equals MC delta T. So we have the mass of the copper times the specific heat capacity of the copper times the change in temperature for the copper. Lots of subscripts <coughs> is equal to the, oops, forgot the negative sign, negative, and if it makes more sense to you, you can put parentheses around this, the mass of the water times the specific heat capacity of the water times the change in temperature of the water. Q for the one equals Q for the other. It's just that one's receiving and one's giving. So they are opposite in sign. Q for the copper is MC delta T with these parameters referring to the copper. The reason this is going to work out is that one of these temperature changes is positive and one is negative. And that takes care of the negative sign over here. Well, what do we have information for? Do we know the mass of the copper? That's what we're trying to find. Um, well, what's this mass? That's the mass of the water. I'm just going to highlight that because we know what that is. Here we have two temperatures for water. Could we calculate delta T? Yeah. yeah. And we have two temperatures for copper. Can we calculate delta T? Yeah. So this is what we're trying to find. We are missing the specific heat capacities. Where do we find those? In a chart. In a chart. So we're going to go back to that chart back here somewhere. <coughs> Copper's there, 0.385. And water? 4.18. So I'm going to go back over here and write that information in. And for the copper, So it turns out we do have the specific heat capacities. And we've got all the variables except one. We're good. I recommend rearranging the equation before you start solving for it. Um, I, th I think it's more straightforward that way. So to solve for M for copper here, we're going to divide both sides by the specific heat capacity of copper and the change in temperature for copper. And so we get our equation, the mass of copper is equal to negative mass of water, specific heat capacity of water, change in temperature of water, divided by specific heat capacity of copper and change in temperature for copper. Well, we said we could find the temp change in temperatures, but we haven't actually done that yet, so now is a good time to do that.
the change in temperature is the final minus the initial. And that matters because one's negative and one's positive and they need to be correct. So for the water, the final temperature is 24.2 and I'm gonna subtract 22.7. And this has a positive temperature change of 1.5 degrees Celsius, which makes sense because the water got warmer. Its temperature went up, up is generally associated with positive. Um, where can I put this? Delta T. For the copper, ended at 24.2. We subtract the initial, 65. This one's going to be negative. The, temp the, the copper was warm to start with, and it cooled down. Its temperature went down. Down is negative. So 24.2 minus 65.4. Negative 41.2. Well, that's kind of sloppy. Is the temperature change the same but opposite for these two things? No, the water went up 1.5 degrees. The, the metal went down 41.2 degrees. Really different. The major reason for that is the difference in the specific heat capacities. Copper has a very small specific heat capacity. Its temperature changes a lot when you put a little bit of heat into it. Water has a large specific heat capacity. The difference in masses also has um, a part in this, but we don't know what the mass of the copper is. And um, it's the heat capacity that has the biggest effect. So now I'm going to put the, the terms into my equation. So I've got the mass of water, 95.7 grams, specific heat capacity of water, 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius, temperature change, 1.5 degrees Celsius. And then in the denominator, I have the information for the copper specific heat capacity, 0.385 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Temperature change, negative 41.2 degrees Celsius. So let's look at what's going to cancel out of this. I have a negative in the numerator and a negative in the denominator. Those are going to go away. Um, and then I have a lot of units that are going to cancel out. So this is a big mess of units, joules per gram degree Celsius. But I have the same mess in the denominator, and so I can cancel them with one fell swoop. Gone. And I've got degree Celsius and degree Celsius, so I can cancel those. And I'm left with grams which is cool because I'm trying to find the mass. I'm also left with not nearly enough space to finish this problem, so I'm going to erase the title up here. So now I'm ready to do this on my calculator. Again, I have two numbers multiplied in the denominator, so I need to be careful. If you see this as point, pointer, point three eight five times 41.2, and that's what you naturally want to put into your calculator. That's fine. Let's see how fat is that. But then you need to put parentheses around that if you're going to use times down there. Okay? So I've got, I'm going to find that the mass of the copper is equal to 95.7 times 4.18 times 1.5 divided by, and most students will want to use open parentheses, 0.385 times 41.2, close the parentheses, equals. And I'm getting a bunch of digits and I realize, oh, how many significant figures should I have in my answer? Two. 
too. Because this temperature change came down to two significant figures. So 37, that's my last significant figure, but just because it's what I do, I add two more digits, grams. And then I'm going to round this and call this 38 grams. <coughs> Any questions? We'll be doing an experiment with um, calculations like this next week. Woohoo, right? So excited, I can tell. We'll see if I got it right. Oh. No. Come on, where are we? There we go. Hmm, 37.8. So they were sloppy with the sig figs, but same difference. Okay, so we talked about work as being um, a force through a distance, so I'm going to exert a force on this chair and slide it away from here. I just did work on the chair, and I'm going to do some more work on the chair, and there it's under the table. Another kind of work is pressure volume work, and this happens when a force caused by a change in volume acts against an external pressure. So this is the type of work that occurs in an internal combustion engine. Inside the piston, we have an explosion, uh, a combustion with the gasoline and air, and that causes the gases to increase in volume. That increase in volume pushes on the piston, and it pushes the piston against pressure. And so work is done by the gas expanding. <coughs> when the gas expands, the change in, in volume is positive, right? But the system, the combustion reaction, is doing work on the surroundings, so the work itself is negative. So we have to account for that. So the W gas, the work for the system is negative, so we have to throw a negative sign in here. The work done here is negative P external times the change in volume. So whatever the external pressure is that this gas is expanding against times the change in its volume. So the units we would end up with here, pressure in atmospheres, change in volume in liters, right, would give us units of atmosphere liters or liter times atmospheres. Um, but work has to be in joules, and so there's a relationship between joules and atmosphere liters, excuse me. And 101.3 joules is equal to one liter atmosphere. And that is a conversion factor that you'd be given on an exam, but you do have to remember that it exists to go look for it, right? <coughs> Here we have a more detailed look at what's happening inside the piston. We have the initial state. Um, so we have a volume, and the volume is the area times the height. So when the change occurs, this area has been moved through this delta height. So that's, that's the uh, through a distance part. So it's been moved. So the volume change is the area times the change in height. So let's do an example. Cylinder equipped with a piston expands against an external pressure of 1.58 atmospheres. If the initial volume is 0.485 liters and the final volume is 1.245 liters, how much work in joules is done? So we'll go through here and pull out their numbers. Um, we've got 1.58 atmospheres. What's that? Pressure. And we've got a volume initial, it says, of 0.485 liters, and a final volume of 1.245 liters. We're asked for work. 
And the equation we just learned is that work is equal to negative P delta V. So we need the change in volume. That delta means final minus initial. So this is the final volume minus the initial volume, 1.245 minus 0.485. Point seven six, um, and it's actually point seven six zero because there's three decimal places there, and the unit is liters. So we can put the pressure and the volume into this equation. We need the negative sign there. Pressure is one point five eight atmospheres, and the change in pressure is, I'm sorry, change in volume. 0.760 liters. So 1.58 times 0.76 with a negative. My calculator is saying 1.2008. And the unit there would be atmospheres times liters. And my starting numbers there had three significant figures, so the result should have three sig figs. Does this answer the question? We have to convert to joules. We're close. So we need that relationship between atmosphere liters and joules. 101.3 joules is equal to one atmosphere liter. multiplied by 101.3 and I should have three significant figures I get 121.64 joules which rounds to 122 joules yes the reason that the the it's actually not that the pressure is negative, it's that we need the sign on the work to be correct. So when this happens, the gas is the system, the gas is doing the work, right? So the work is negative because the gas is doing the work. I lost my negative sign. There's a negative here and a negative here. So then in the equation, we have to account for that because the change in volume is positive. And so that's why the negative is here. Um, if we leave the negative off, that's the work done on the surroundings. It would be positive for the surroundings. But it's negative for the, the system, that ex the gas expanding. Any other questions? <coughs> Here's another example. Uh, when fuel is burned in a cylinder equipped with a piston, the volume expands from 0.255 liters to 1.45 liters against an external pressure of 1.02 atmospheres. In addition, 875 joules is emitted as heat. What is delta E for the burning of the fuel? So here we're talking about work the volume expanding against the pressure, and the heat. So this goes back to an expression we learned on uh, Tuesday. The change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W. So we need to identify what's Q and what's W and add them together. So we're looking at these numbers. I've got 0.255 liters and 1.45 liters and I have 1.02 atmospheres and I've got 875 joules. Now this time I wrote down this equation. Um, a lot of times I just start with the numbers. If you write the numbers down and you're not sure, well what variables am I even looking for? It can be helpful to get into the equation to see, oh, I need a Q and a W. 
so that might help me identify things. It says the volume expands from this to that. So there's a change in volume, right? This is the initial, that's the final. Could I calculate a change in volume? Yeah. So the change in volume is the final minus the initial. One point one nine five liters. <coughs> and then P uh one point oh two is an a pressure, right? And then eight seventy five joules is emitted as heat. So this is Q. The system here we're talking about the fuel burning. The fuel burning emits heat. Is that negative or positive when it goes out? When money leaves your wallet, do you write that down as positive or negative? It's negative. So this Q here is negative 875. The negative sign is not in the equation. We have to understand from the direction of things that Q is negative. So for delta E, we have Q, which is negative 875 joules. And then we need to add work, but we've just got these other things. We actually have to calculate the work. Work is equal to negative P delta V. Oh, we have P and delta V. So the pressure 1.02 atmospheres times the volume, one point volume change. Yes. If it said the, um, the, the reaction absorbed 875 joules, then that would be positive. But it's emitted, it, it went out. So we only want to watch out the positive and negative in regards to heat? Um, heat, volume change, um, work, energy change. There's a lot of things. Temperature change. Well, that makes sense because you do subtraction. <coughs> you know that when you're reading yeah. the problem, Right. So can I add joules and atmosphere liters? No, I can't. I need to convert this to joules. <coughs> so I multiply by 101.3. One twenty three point four seven joules. So that's the work. I can add that in here. Oh, I lost my negative sign. Those negative signs are very slippery. Right? They just literally fall through the cracks in the floor. So you have to watch out for those guys. So minus one twenty three point four seven joules. And it's another reason why it's important to be able to show your work. Um, and some of you are getting a lot better about texting me with questions. You know, you do a homework problem and you got it wrong. And you look at it and you can't figure out. And so you ask me help. And I say, well, show me your work. Well, if you've got work like this, you take a picture and send it to me. And I can look at it. And I would notice that, oh, the negative sign disappeared, right? And so then I can give you a hint and you can fix it. Another point about showing work is 
This is how we communicate with other people explaining how we got to a number. And there are many professions where you have to be able to do this. You have to document what you did. And engineering and science especially, this is the sort of thing we need to be able to write down. So even if you can do these problems without writing it down, you still need to be able to write it down. So you should practice. Okay, so um, negative 875 plus a negative 123.47. Calculator says negative 998.47 joules. Um, but paying attention to significant figures I'm adding here. Um, this is in the ones place. This is in the ones place. So my answer should be in the ones place. And I'm going to say this is minus 998 joules. The change in energy for the fuel burning is negative 998 joules. Any questions? Yes. Pardon me? Yeah, this could happen in a car. Um, it could happen in a lot of, a lot of situations, uh, you know, other places too. So, yeah, that's a great question. Where's the energy going to? Well, it's going out in two forms, heat and work. So heat, it's warming up the surroundings. And the work is the expansion. Um, in a piston, it's really pushing the piston, right? So that's a force through a distance. If you had um, one of those little propane cylinders, you know, and it says do not incinerate, right? They mean that. If you get that thing hot enough, it will explode. It will combust. And it will expend a lot of heat and a lot of work force, right? And that thing's gonna explode, it's gonna send little bits of metal and a shock wave that might knock you down. So that's where the energy went. Where did that energy come from? It was stored in the propane as chemical energy. Gasoline has a lot of stored chemical energy in it. And when we ignite it, it releases that. Right? <coughs> Any other questions? Minus 998. 